Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along to this uh, later session this afternoon. My name's Alistair Leake, and I work for the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. And this afternoon, we're going to be discussing farmer clusters. And I'm delighted to welcome here on the stage with me three people who have considerable experience of farmer clusters, and they're going to take you through that. Uh, before we start, though, let's just have a look at the origins of this, this tremendous idea, which um, I suppose actually fairly can be claimed to have, uh, have been created in a number of different forms around the country. But probably the first formal um, cluster that we, we actually recall was back in 2012 when the coalition government announced a competition to create 12 nature improvement areas around the country. Uh, there was funding attached to these. Uh, there were about 90 applications. And of the 12 that were selected, one was a group of farmers who put together 10,000 hectares of land into a cluster and produced a plan of what they wanted to do within that cluster to improve uh, wildlife and biodiversity. Now, we, we all know that species don't rep uh, recognize far, farm boundaries. They, they, they like to wander around a bit. So to create a, a bigger mass of land in which we can encourage species is, is clearly a good thing to do. Uh, and that Marlborough Downs uh, nature improvement area has been such a success that it not only continues today, but has inspired at least that we, that we know of another 150 groups of farmers to get together and to work together, which, which, is, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I think going forward with the opportunities for um, biodiversity uh, enhancement uh, and carbon trading and so on, farmers being able to pool the natural assets they have in order to trade them, uh, it's going to be very much more attractive to big companies who won't want to deal with individuals, but rather deal with groups. Uh, so really exciting times ahead. But before we get to the times ahead, let's start with the things that we've got now. And first up, uh, we've got Lizzie, who looks after um, clusters in the Wensum catchment, and she's going to tell you about her successes in that area. So over to you. Thank you, Alistair. I hope everybody can hear me all right. Um, it's lovely to be here, and uh, thank you for coming to listen to us talking about collaboration. So firstly, why am I here? So I want to try and stress the points of the, the benefits of collaboration, of working together. But there's a very, very strong point that I want you to try and take home. The development of social capital, and I'll come on to the definition in a minute, can solve, I believe, all our agricultural issues. So that's my sort of take-home message. But what is social capital? We talk a lot around natural capital, we talk about financial capital. So social capital is a banked wealth of trust, collaboration and well-being. So you might say to me, Lizzie, that's nonsense. There's nothing wrong at the moment. But actually, we've got some incredibly strained times at the moment. We've got a huge policy shift. The RPA and government relationships with farmers are at an all-time low, and we've got an environmental crisis. And look at this for a quote. This is a quote from a social scientist. The UK government favours a top-down command and control approach, which is rarely effective and creates resentment. Look at that as a quote. And that shows you how much they understand farmers, right? So, hold on to your seats, because I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to show you how you can enhance your business, boost your well-being, and solve the environmental crisis. So, who am I? So, my background is farming, my, or my family are farmers, and the guy in the middle there is my dad, and he's taught me a huge amount, from hedgerow laying right through to strands and strands of uh, electric fencing. <laughs> But that's given me a fantastic grounding in understanding how farmers tick, which I think is very important. 
So who are we? So we are a collaboration group. So we are a group of 27 farmers working together, but we are truly farmer-led, so we are a bottom-up approach. And we're also totally self-funded. So we have a membership fee, they pay in, and then they get my time that goes towards it. Total mix of farming businesses, but the really interesting thing about it is that we're bound by water. So even though there's a whole range of different types of farming businesses, there's something that brings us all together. So how does it actually work? What's the structure like? Well, I'm full-time and I work for them as an advisor. We have a steering group where we decide key decisions, uh, and we have a membership plus sponsors, and we also gain a huge amount of revenue through, for example, grant opportunities, net gain, which I will talk to you about a little bit differently later. But very crucially, we are our own entity. We have our own bank account, and that gives us a huge amount of empowerment. What do we actually work towards? So this is a diagram of how we sort of split up our priorities. So we've got water and soil quality on one side, and we've got biodiversity on the other. So these are some of the key projects that we might work towards. And I might get some farmers that take up all of these projects, and I might get some farmers that just dabble in a few. But we do everything from cover cropping right through to supplementary feeding. We've got a fantastic group of turtle doves, which is incredibly rare. And right in the middle, can you see there's a huge amount that the farmers gain themselves? So countryside stewardship help, net gain assistance, looking at the net gain market, and obviously we've got the group learning. So how can collaboration transform your business? I'm going to take you through a few key points, and I promise you, hopefully, you'll be convinced by the end. So drawing down to farm business support. So think about how we're going to get ready for Elm. We need to make sure that we have an absolute handle on our assets and measuring exactly what we have in our business. Remember, Elm is going to be very competitive. And to be able to compete with, for example, the National Trust, RSPB, we need to have that data. I'm able to project manage all of the enhancements. So at the busiest time, for example, harvest, I'm overseeing all of the pond restoration. So I'm trying to make it very easy for farmers to actually take part in projects. At the moment, we're in an elm test and trial, which is feeding back crucial evidence to DEFRA. As my quote earlier, they do not understand farmers. They need to understand farmers if we are going to get the elm scheme to function adequately. And then, of course, I'm offering grants, discounts, training materials. Why wouldn't you want all of that? Community. Now, this is something incredibly important. Farming can be insular. It can be lonely. And think of the social aspect of actually meeting with like-minded people. And we've got shared learning. So think about it. If you're a farmer, you're going to enjoy learning from other farmers, right? Rather than be dictated to by government or dictated to by NGOs. And I'm using motivation, I'm using competitiveness to drive that change. And of course, we've got our support network. Now, power and influence is, is incredibly important. On the little pie chart, I hope you can see the blue line, the blue sort of pie area is 54% of all phosphate in the River Wensum coming from sewage treatment works. And the reason that's important is because at the moment there's a white paper sitting in government saying that we need to grass over the whole of the catchment because the farmers have got too much of a footprint with nitrate and phosphate leaching. So think about the power and influence we have in terms of gathering our own data. So let me explain this. We are the only organization in the whole of the catchment that is doing any water quality monitoring. A group of farmers. Where's the Environment Agency? Where's Natural England? That's incredibly powerful because we're not reacting. We're taking control ahead. And I think one of the things I've noticed since I first started this job is there's so many stereotypes in different organizations. And I'm, I'm working to break those down. Because as I said earlier, there's so much misconception and misunderstanding about farmers, what type of nutrient losses we have, et cetera. 
And promotion. This is something which I think is, is very important to farmers individually. All farmers want to feel good about what they're doing, and that's very, very important to well-being. So that kind of feel-good factor. So, for example, one of my Wenson farmers said to me that they met someone else, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah you're a Wenson farmer, aren't you? That feel-good feeling, we need that. That's so important to what we are trying to achieve in our businesses. And we're building up a market. I've had so many conversations with people today around building up this market, whether it be through net gain or whether actually we're building up our own product. So therefore, we need to have something collectively that is an asset. And then the engagement side is really interesting. So, for example, you wouldn't normally get farmers engaging with like angling groups or bird surveying groups, but this enables that opportunity. And this is actually landscape scale change. We're not just talking about it, we're creating change. Think 10,000 hectares of farmers working together and getting stuff done. It creates change. That's what we need if we're going to, to assist our environment. So for example, I talked about the turtle doves. We've got coordinated supplementary feeding. We've got hedgerow management. If that is done and better connected, we are supporting our whole environment. So question to you, what do you think creates all of this drive, this success, and the results? Have a little think to yourself. It's relationships. As I mentioned earlier, we talk a lot around social capital, but it's proven that social capital equals results. It's been proven for years. So farmer to advisor relationships, farmer to farmer relationships is absolutely crucial. And it's really interesting. I've been listening to so many different presentations and it keeps coming back. Collaboration, working together, get stuff done. And here's just a few quotes from my farmers about how they feel about the group. So I've got people that are more interested in conservation. I've got people that feel empowered by being in a collaborative group. And I've got people that never even used to talk to their neighbors until now. So as a summary, here's some of the benefits that you could see by, for example, being involved in a group and who wouldn't want all of these different elements? I think it's absolutely crucial to the future of our farming businesses. So I hope that inspires you, and I look forward to some challenging questions when we've all finished speaking. Thank you. Well, if you weren't inspired by that, all I can say is you must be uninspirable. Everything on my list and more was ticked there, Lizzie. Absolutely fantastic and really uplifting, actually. There is so much potential, and, and we'll move to that shortly. In the meantime, William will give you um, his experience of working within the cluster. So over to you, William. I'm inspired. Um, yes, our, our cluster group is in Hampshire, Selborne. Um, why have a cluster group in Selborne? Selborne, if it's known to you at all, is known because of Gilbert White natural history of Selborne. The, the fourth most published book in the English language. Uh, he was famous not least for discovering the harvest mouse as a separate species. Uh, he was uh, a naturalist that's, that's been copied for, for hundreds of years since. I think the one thing he got wrong was he thought swallows hibernated in wells, but you know you can't get everything right in the 18th century. But if you can't do natural history in the parish of Selborne, where, you know, where can you do it? Um, it's a that's a, that's a map of, of, of our cluster. Uh, it's quite a variegated landscape. As you saw in the previous slide, uh, it's very known for the, for the steep scarp hangers uh, and, the, uh, and, and the chalk above. It's also a very varied farming type. Uh, we, um, we've, got, we've got arable, sheep, dairy. I'm a fruit farmer. We've got lavender. Uh, our latest member is actually uh, establishing a vineyard. Um, we got started back in 2014 in response to uh, the development Alistair was talking about, the, the, uh, the nature improvement area at Marlborough Down. And we had some conversations with the Game of Wildlife Conservation Trust and with the South Downs National Park, of which we're, we're a part. Um, Kate Faulkner, a neighboring farmer, and I then went knocking on doors in our area. And much to our surprise, 
literally everyone was up for it. Before we knew it, we had 20 land managers on board. 16 of those were farmers. And interesting, the rest were land managers uh, in, in the area such as the National Trust at Selborne Common, such as the Hampshire Wildlife Trust and the, Woodla uh, and the Woodland Trust. So it's, it's not just your archetypal farmers, it's, it's land managers from that sector as well. And that's been a very helpful partnership right from the beginning. We cover around 4,500 hectares. Uh, and in the beginning, we were, we were trying to do it ourselves. Um, we, some larger farms, some smaller. Our, our average farm size is actually 100 hectares, so quite, quite diverse. But in 2016, uh, the government launched a fund for uh, facilitation, so to employ somebody to assist us keeping the show on the road. And that's Debbie Miller in the middle of this photo here, formerly of FWAG. So, um, with her help, uh, we set about uh, finding, uh, as, as Lizzie said, what we wanted as farmers from a bottom-up perspective, what we wanted to focus on. And we chose a range of target species that you can see in the slide there. Um, and uh, everything from yellow, yellow hammer through to brown hair streak butterflies. Of course, the harvest mouse had to be in there because of Gilbert White. Um, and that choice of species led, much as Lizzie has discussed, to delivery of certain habitats in the landscape. Uh, we did the hedge in the edge management uh, for, for harvest mice. You can see some hedge laying there, some tuscary grass, also good for the barn owls. We were supplementary feeding through the winter uh, uh, and uh, also now starting to move into uh, provision, targeted provision of pollinator habitats and ponds. So what are the benefits of a cluster? What have we, what have we gained from that? Well, well, first and most obviously, we've just learned a tremendous amount. The number of training events we've had a group have been extraordinary. Uh, it's all very well to talk about uh, establishing habitats, but as farmers, it's not something we're trained to do. And we're fortunate to have had events on, on wildflower uh, margin establishment, farmland bird IDs, how to harvest, uh, how to survey for brown hair streak, what we do for management of certain uh, species, target species such as partridge and lapwing, and so on and so forth. But I think, as Lizzie was saying, it's the social capital of those events and getting us together as a group that's, that's been fundamental. Our, our WhatsApp farmer group now is as important for, for you know, security issues or reporting fly tipping as it is for boasting about lapwing on each farm. And it's become, you don't always see your, your neighbors in, in the way that you'd expect. And this has been you know, a, a great way of, of getting everyone on the same page. So something that's been very important for us, perhaps not surprisingly, coming from uh, uh, Gilbert White's parish is, is the surveying, is the natural history itself. We have invested an awful lot of time and effort in getting that data that Lizzie referred to that is going to be so important in the brave new world when you're competing for, for funds with other groups. Um, so we've, we've, in the last year, for example, we've done 35, 35 har harvest mouse survey transects. We've, surveyed 30 hedgerows for brown hair streak eggs. We've walked 43 transects across 24 farms last winter, as it says here, last, for, for uh, 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 bird surveys. We've done numerous butterfly surveys uh, and surveys for birds in the winters as well. And as farmers, we've got stuck into this as well as, as amateur natural historians with some very competitive lapwing surveys between farms. And uh, our next plan is to put uh, tunnel traps in for dormice uh, and uh, survey those as well. And none of this could have been done without a vast number of, of volunteers who have been helping us. And I'll, I'll come back to them shortly. Just some examples of the sort of data that, that, that we're gathering. This one here on butterflies. Um, uh, and, and here is a, uh, a, an annual report that, that we've produced. Well, two annual reports, one on birds, one on butterflies. And we're putting together now a five-year report on, on, on the, the trends in wildlife in, in, in our cluster. What's the point of all this data? Well, as we've said, we need this now uh, uh, to compete for funds. And crucially, it allows targeting of those delivery of habitat at the landscape scale. Because, of course, the whole point of this is the whole is more than the sum of the parts. You're only as good as your neighbor. Uh, and if you're not all buying into this, uh, the butterflies and the birds don't observe the farm boundaries. So this is an example of a, of a mapping we've done for, um, for pollinators. Uh, we've bird records for, for, for yellow hammers there across the parish are uploaded to living record. That then identifies gaps in the network where we, either we need to uh, prioritize more survey work 
uh, or uh, get habitat in place for those species. So all of this mapping, all of this data is, 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 is hugely important to us. Uh, here again, a, a, a heat map for brown hair streak eggs that we've discovered leading to various management prescriptions around managing our hedgerows to, to uh, encourage blackthorn where the brown hair streak lay their eggs. Also with this data uh, and, 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 and the information we've got, we've been successful in applying for funding uh, for two or three schemes locally. The Beeline scheme is a scheme for pollinators run through the South Downs National Park. Uh, SO uh, are also doing some greening net gain work for a, because of a pipeline that goes through our area. And again, via the, the National Park, they've made funding available for hedgerow restoration, planting and laying. And we're putting a bid in now for the, um, for the government green recovery challenge fund. Social capital, we heard that about that earlier. Community engagement. That's been just so, so important for our group. We've, we've, done a, we've, we've put a lot of effort in, really, to um, getting our community on board, to, to, to preaching, really, a little bit about what, what we're achieving. Um, we've had farm walks. Um, we've uh, done articles in the parish magazine. We've done a local newsletter. We've done an article for the Hampshire Ornithological Society. We've been active, to the best of our abilities, on social media. Um, but um, uh, we've also done a, a logo competition in our, in, in our local school, uh, which was a lot of fun. Um, but, but lastly, and mo most critically, it's the volunteer resource that, that I mentioned earlier that's, that's been very important to us. We've got no less than 46 local naturalists, uh, uh, local spet birders, uh, botanists, who are out walking transects in their own uh, uh, free time for us or, or around the transects building up a great uh, array of, of data. And in fact, during COVID, the numbers increased because birders had less area to go and they were more moving back into, uh, into Gilbert White's parish. And this information exchange is, is a two-way uh, event. They're, they're helping us with the survey data and we're feeding back via social events like the one in the, in the picture there where we laid on a, a lunch for them. Spe we're feeding back the work that we're doing on our farms because these guys are great ambassadors for us in the, in the, in the wildlife communities. Um, we've not all, they've not always had you know, the rosiest view of farmers, let's be honest. So having this direct engagement, both as members of the partnership with the Woodland Trust, with the Wildlife Trust, but also as volunteers with local amateur naturalists has been very, very important for us. Um, so what next for us, really? Um, well, um, our five-year facilita facilita facilitation funding for Debbie has come to, is coming to an end shortly. We're also putting in place a self-funding mechanism. That's difficult because that's only really going to buy us about four hours of facilitation time a, a, a week, which is probably not enough. So we're trying to build uh, time for a coordinator into the, uh, into the various funding bids. Because we've got some ambitious schemes um, coming up. Uh, we want to do more capital projects on, 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 uh, on pond re restoration, uh, on hedgerows, uh, on woodland rides, to put more habitat in. And the, the latest and brightest idea is to have a lot of oven-ready projects that we can take off the shelf when funding is available. Um, and if it's appropriate to say oven-ready about bird reintroduction, the next scheme is to look, do, a, do a scoping study for reintroducing uh, cell bunting and tree sparrow, which are no longer present in our area and getting them back in. So with that, I will pass on. Thank you very much, William. Excellent. And uh, finish up, Tom? Finish up, yes. A, okay. a, a more local representation. A more local okay. representation, yes. I, no slides for me. And I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of here. I feel I should, should represent the newbie uh, because um, much as our group has actually been around for a very long time, I took over the lead uh, farmer role two years ago. Um, and and uh, I, I suppose we probably represent uh, what's happening quite a lot out there, which is um, um, a cluster group that has, has, that has uh, done very well um, through the facilitation fund, uh, been run exceptionally well by Elizabeth from Fwag East, who's been, been sitting over there just now. Um, and we're sort of sitting at this, this place. We recognize, uh, we absolutely recognize the value of our group. And, that, and, and um, you know, setting up a group from scratch is, is a big deal. Maybe we might touch on that later. But we know we've got something great. 
and um, and it's it's just about uh, moving forward in these new times that the, we've already sort of heard a lot about about the opportunities that that farm clusters can create and so we're sitting right on the edge so it's a, that, that's the sort of perspective I'm going to bring but very quickly just to sort of give you a summary of uh, of, of the West Cam's hundreds um, it was actually uh, it was actually set up in 2005 so um, but but in, in, in it, as a as a group of four sort of um, key farmers who all uh, were sort of in possession of some ancient woodlands in, in Cambridge, which is an unusual thing to find ancient woodlands in Cambridge. And uh, they were thinking along the lines of, um, you know, collaborative hedgerow networks and the like. Um, and they did a bit of uh, survey work around that. And then, um, you know, brought on a few other farmers, uh, did some projects. And then the facilitation fund came in in 2015 and, 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 and at that point, we, they had 20 farmers, I think, represented about 6,600 hectares and uh, had a very successful time in facilitation funds, a good example of how the facilitation fund should have worked well. I mean, I think we, you know, we all benefited from it. We all got to know each other. Um, I actually sort of joined back into farming around 2015. It's a fantastic opportunity for me to get to know everyone as well. Lots of training, uh, lots of support, a lot of stuff that's been talked about here. Um, some projects, some, some quite cleverly um, interweaved projects through ELS HLS schemes that Elizabeth um, did, did very, very carefully to make sure that we did actually do collaborative work, even if we weren't necessarily seeing the, seeing the big picture. Uh, but we had a very good facilitator to, to, to make sure that worked for, for biodiversity in our cluster group. And as I said, then we, when we got to this point where the facilitation fund ran out, we all agreed wholeheartedly that you know, we had something special here. And with, you know, with, with, a, with a lack of funding, we've, we've really um, been, uh, you know, doing an AGM, doing a farm walk, um, talking quite a bit about uh, opportunities arising. And, um, and when I took over the lead, you know, unfortunately, pandemic hit, it's been, a, it been, a, been more difficult to sort of move things forward. But we did some quite interesting work, did a, did a quite detailed survey, which is sort of as much as we could manage during COVID. Um, rather than speaking too much individually with each other, but but you know definitely got some great co confirmation about um, you know wanting to keep the group going, about uh, you know uh, setting up a more formal steering group, um, about uh, membership fees, agreeing that membership fees are probably quite a helpful thing to have, um, and and went into quite a lot of detail around uh, you know what what we would expect out of paying a membership fee or what direction we want to go in. So we've, we've, we've laid a, a pretty good, uh, I'd say a pretty good sort of baseline of where we want to move now. And I think we are, we are experiencing, and hopefully we could talk a, bit, a little bit about this in, 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 in the Q&A session, but you know, we're experiencing some of the sort of difficulties and hurdles um, the next step involves. Uh, but we absolutely recognize um, you know, the value uh, of the collaboration and, and the, the amazing things that, um, that, that, that we could do. I mean, I'm, I'm, we do do stuff, all right, and, and you know, I, could, I could carry on talking around that, but I think uh, I'd really like to sort of carry on the Q&A uh, about, about some of the things uh, that we're going to, uh, you know, you know have, to, have to start doing to move on to the next step. That's okay. Yep, lovely. Thank you very much, Tom. That's great. And just before I throw it open to the, to the audience to ask questions, uh, uh, just back, back to the panel. Was, was there anything in your presentation that you forgot to mention or wish you'd mentioned or perhaps wish to emphasize? Um, uh, and if not, fine, we'll, we'll, we'll go straight to the audience. So just, just back to you. Anything you want to add? That's great. Well I, done. I will just add one, one thing. In the, the other thing that's come up um, that's maybe pushed some of us a little bit uh, quicker uh, and it's very, uh, perhaps a little bit cluster specific, but we have the East West Rail potentially running straight through the middle of our cluster. And we also have quite a lot of work with Highways England uh, and a huge amount of housing development. And I think we are, we are, um, we are not, we don't want to be taken for a ride by any of those people. And I think we also have the ability as a collaborative group to have a very strong voice to, um, to put uh, nature higher, higher up the priority uh, list than it probably currently is for these infrastructure projects. So, 
Yeah, no, excellent point. Yeah, thank you. Right, ladies and gentlemen, you have a wealth of experience here on stage to tap into. Uh, Paul is there with the roving mic, yeah. So if you've got a question, we have one here next to the uh, stanchion. Am I allowed to hold it? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, a practical question, really. We, so I work for a, rivers, a local rivers trust, and we are, as part of one of our projects, trying to set up a couple of farm clusters. Um, do you have a sweet spot for sort of um, numbers of meetings per year and that kind of thing? Like practical, you know, how, how much sort of um, obligation are you requesting of your farmers? Is there... I'm sure a sweet spot if it's you know too much obligation or not enough and you kind of lose lose track of people that are interested in that kind of thing. Right, Lizzie would like to go first. Yeah, sure. Oh, am I on? Is it on? Yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, really good question. I think um, it's a really interesting one because it depends on the appetite. So I've spoken to a lot of different farmer groups and that's the beauty of them is that actually a lot of them some can actually be very, very active and want, you know, 12 events a year, and some are less active. For me, the one-to-one -one time is, is absolutely crucial. And I meet a lot of farmer clusters that they've got the facilitation funding where they can't get the one-to-one -one time, and they feel like it's a bit slow sometimes. So actually, for me, it's the one-to-one -one time that gets stuff done. Um, but I rely on the appetite from my farmers to kind of find a, a balance. What I will say, though, is the thing I've learnt is to have a balance of events where you would pull in a guest speaker and also events which you would have just with your farmers. So, for example, you know, I'll do a cover crop event where it is just discussion with our guys or a hedgerow event, and I think that's very important. So you're not always feeling like you're drawing people in. But for us, it's around about 10 group events per year. Do you want to say something? Yeah, we, we have a couple of formal events a year, every six months as a whole, as a whole cluster, um, uh, which is actually probably enough for the, for the, for the formal uh, business. Then we, we have a, uh, a group that's, a subgroup that's focusing on sort of future funding options that, that, that meets outside of that. But as Lizzie says, it's the, it's the training meetings that are, that are critical. And we, we probably have four to six of those a year, but they're as and when, uh, depending on the season, depending on people's time and availability, and obviously it'll go slightly with the agricultural calendar. Um, but those have been, in terms of group, uh, getting everyone together, those have been the most important, I think. Yeah, and I'd just like to say, I'm, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure Elizabeth remembers some of the, the feedback, but you often, you know, if you sift through some feedback that they had to do through the facilitation fund, you often have, you know, half of it saying we, we need more meetings and the other half saying we need less meetings. So it's quite, I mean, I think that, that brings up an interesting point about cluster groups, which is... The, the same as in life, you know, you are dealing with, uh, you know, lo lots of people who have lots of um, similarities and they're all farming, they're all doing this. But at the same time, you know, they're, they're, they're people and they're different people and some people want to move slower and some people want to move faster. And it's, it, you know, I think that's a, that's a, that's a key skill of, of a facilitator to, to um, you know, to, to make sure you're, 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 you're pulling, pulling people along who need a bit of help and, and you're not, you're, you know, hold, hold, holding back the people who are diving in the deep end a bit too fast, I think. So there's a real skill there for sure, yeah. Okay, we have the next question already. Thank you. Uh, if you want to ask a question, do put your hand up. I'll, I'll spot you and get the mic to you, but go ahead. Thank you. Um, another question about sweet spot. What's a, in terms of the size of the group? Uh, we're setting up a group at the moment. There's about, in one sort of upper catchment, there's a natural boundary of about uh, eight or 10 farmers. But then we're wondering whether we should be bigger to have a critical mass or do we stick to something that's tight and well-defined. I could, I could start that if you want. Um, yeah, so, so uh, it's an interesting point. So when we ended our facilitation fund, I think there were about 20 or 21 members. And, um, and, and, and we, were, you know, we were questioning, well, you know, what is the sweet spot? Because obviously there's a, there comes a point where you just, you, you know, you're, I think William said herding sheep. Uh, it's more rudely herding cats maybe sometimes, but you, the, the point is is at a point at which it's just hard to uh, work with too many people. I think we're still in that sort of figure where we're, we're actually hitting about 27 now. And I think there are obviously, you, you know, uh, there comes a point where you, you've got to ask the question, well, you know, how many people do we want? Um, to be honest, our steering group said, uh, you know, 
what's almost more important is enthusiasm. You know, if someone wants to join and they're really enthusiastic, I think there's a huge value to that, right? Um, and, uh, and obviously, you have to be, have some sort of limits and, and some boundaries. And we have the Ribery in the south, and, you know, we, we're both sides of the, of the Bourne Brook, both the tributaries of the Cam, and maybe we sort of vaguely stick inside that Cam, uh, uh, you know, Cam catchment. Um, but we also said, you know what, it doesn't, does it matter so much? So, you know, if there are certain projects that are bound by catchments or bound by s certain areas, that doesn't mean that you can't carry on doing those projects um, within the group. Some people are involved in it and some people aren't. And again, if you end up hitting that 30 or 32, 33, 34, and you're thinking, hey, it's a bit big, you know, there's always that potential of, of, of you know, creating two sister groups as well, you know, and, and, and working together on certain things, but not on others. So, you know, we haven't got to that point yet. Um, yeah, I think size is such a, a common question. I often get asked this because people think, I get people come to me and say, I want to do more, but we're quite small. And actually, I don't think size matters. I think it's quality, not quantity. And I, w I was speaking at an event um, last week, and they had a map up, and they were like, right, first things first, let's fill in all the gaps and let's, let's get really, really big. And I said, well, well, actually, let's just hold on for a second. What do you want to do? And you know, where do you want to go? And I think all those have to be considered first, depending on actually how much time you want a facilitator, for example, or depending on where you want to go. You know, our sort of vision is to create a sort of almost like a market for ourselves. So we, we want to go really far with this project, but actually, Interestingly, I'm very guided by the farmers because their feedback to me is that they don't want to lose the authenticity of the group. So I think that's very, very crucial as well. So I think, you know, be guided by your, your fellow farmers and say, if we've got something great here and we're like-minded, I'd say that is, is a correct size. I agree, I think there's no right answer on that. And we, we are located around a village and that's our epicenter, but we're in, in two separate water catchments. So, so half of it disappears into the channel, the rest into the North Sea. We're quite a varied landscape, but it's what works as a group and it, and it, it, and it feels right, ultimately. Very good, I think the next question is already lined up and I've got another one coming after that, Paul. Hi, thank you. Uh, Jose Fajardo from the University of Sheffield. Uh, initially for Lizzie, but also from William and Tom, uh, Lisa, you mentioned in, in your slide that there was uh, some tests and trials in the cluster. So I'm just wondering if you could say a bit more about what is it about and how uh, between the farmers are sharing the knowledge and the experience, but also to know if uh, with William or Tom there are also tests and trials. And also if as a cluster uh, has been some sort of organization or something to uh, speak to DEFRA or to tell your vision about the, the development of the ELM to, to DEFRA? Thank you. Yeah, good question. So essentially, we are involved with a ELM test and trial that's a reverse auction. So what that means is that for a particular plot, so in our case, it's a turtle dove feed plot, the farmers in the group can essentially bid against each other. But the reason it's called a reverse auction is because they can actually undercut each other. Now, my instinct is that DEFRA is trying to work out what's the absolute minimum that we can get away with paying farmers and to see if that project works. So that's the trial. Um, for us, it's been very interesting. And actually, uh, what I've observed, it's actually created a bit of hostility. So on one, the one side, government saying collaboration, collaboration, work together. And the reverse auction model, in our view, does not replicate that. So that's what we're working on at the moment. The the trial itself is also run through the RSPB, but the issue I have with the RSPB is they really struggle to access data and farmers because there's all sorts of history there. And so that's why, for example, I have sort of fortnightly conversations with, with DEFRA themselves. So I'm working really hard to, to get across this really crucial evidence because, as I said earlier, I don't feel that DEFRA understand farmers. I don't think they understand how they tick. I don't think they understand how they want to be rewarded. I don't think they understand how they want to be policed. So I'm trying to have these very regular conversations to break down some of the barriers. The issue I have with DEFRA is that you can speak to a few colleagues and feel like you're making loads of progress, but it's a beast. 
you know? You've got to change the whole cycle. And as I mentioned earlier, I feel like there's quite a lot of systemic uh, misunderstanding around farmers and, and what works. So yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm in regular conversation with DEFRA to hopefully that answers your point. The only trial we've been involved in to date is, is actually around software development for a, a, a mapping company that wanted to work with farmers and, and get feedback. And that was actually really quite interesting. Some of the maps you saw came out of that. We've been fortunate to have um, one of the GWDCT trial farms in our cluster at Rotherfield Estate where they're doing a lot of uh, seed mix trials for, for, for wild bird covers. And that's been not a trial done by the group, but an immensely valuable resource to have within the group for our training days. So we, get, we, we, we see what works and what doesn't. Yeah, I was actually going to, uh, hoping that research would come into this because um, I, I feel that there's a, you know, I think we are starting to understand about citizen science and in this case, uh, you know, farmer led uh, bottom up approach research. Um, and I think uh, for, from a researcher point of view and a university point of view, it's, an, it's a fantastic way of engaging uh, with, with, a, with a sort of coordinated group of, of, of farmers for sure. And actually, interestingly, for the West Cam's hundreds, that's one of the key things that's, um, you know, one of, one of the key outcomes post facilitation fund that has um, has sort of moved us forward we we're, we're part of a bit of a bit of a plug here i guess so we're part of the h3 project which is healthy soils healthy plants healthy people huge um, multi million pound research project over lots of areas and our work package involves looking at um, you know, regenerative agriculture and change through that and looking at biodiversity and soil health and all the rest and actually there is a there is a, a stand for um, the f farmer innovation stand over there where you can get you can actually get involved in the future of that because it's, it's a big 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 piece looking at uh, sustainable food for the for the UK but but uh, coming back to the farm cluster you know that has been great at um, you know bringing us together and giving us a focus as well so so I, I think there's a there's a, a real place for research if you if you want it and on the smaller scale I think most farm walks we often find you wander around and uh, you know, is it actually research? Well, it's certainly sort of experimentation and, and every farm experiments and it's a lovely opportunity to sort of see us uh, do our, our, our little experiments on farm for sure. Lovely, thank you panel. And we've got the next question coming from down here, sir, far away. Will it just work? Yes, it will. Um, I'm in the process of being involved with setting up a cluster next door to Marlborough area, cluster, Nature Improvement Zone, I Allborn. And we are at the moment debating whether we as the sort of organizers or the nascent organizers, we haven't had our first meeting yet, is specify target species we want to change or tar target habitats we want to improve. Is there a, an, an element of you've got to have a really good target that helps define the cluster's sort of enthusiasm? Okay, panel, so there's a little challenge for you. Do you go with the farmer targets or do you go with the government targets? How do you get your priorities right? Who's going to go first? I go with farmer. That, that's the way to motivate people from the beginning. If people set their own goals, uh, it, it makes life very much easier going forward from there. Okay, thanks, William. Lizzie? I think it's beautifully complex. And that's what I love about it, because I remember, so we work with a social scientist, and I remember she came to a meeting once, and she tried to explain what social, social science is like, and she said, here's a graph, like that. It's, it's, it's amazing, because it's so different. When I first started, I spent a long time actually getting to understand what the objectives were with each of the farmers, and, and working out what, what is the common ground here, whilst working out what their individual priorities were, working out what the catchment issues were, and actually what was pressuring us. You know, we were facing a you know, grassing over of the whole catchment. We were facing, you know, a massive misunderstanding of where the pollution's coming from. And that was part of the driving force towards the water quality, as well as then steering everything together. As you saw earlier, we do quite a lot of different projects. I'd say have a range, but have somebody that's skilled enough to understand how to draw all those different elements all together. But don't put too much pressure on yourself too early, I would also say. If you're starting out, I often get people say, how do you do all of that stuff? Well, it's taken a while, you know? So start small, start common ground, and you'll get there. Yeah, and I think, I think to add to that, um, 
I think, I think informed choices are probably quite important as well. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, hopefully you, you, you've, you've got some relationship with, a, with, a, with good ecologists or people who can sort of point you in the right direction as well. I mean, we're, you know, the, we're very lucky that we do have that. And, and, and I think it focuses the mind on, on, on what, what, what the entire catch, uh, what the entire cluster is, is it, you know, is, is, is experiencing rather than just on your own farm, because that's probably another big part of being a facilitator is, is that sort of holistic view of the entire landscape that, you know, I think we all have a bit of an idea as a landowner, but actually, you know, it's amazing what we don't appreciate is actually happening just down the road on someone else's farm. Yeah, well said. I see everybody nodding at that one. Uh, I have another question lined up, and I still have time for a couple more, so we'll go to that question, but put your hand up if you've got one to follow. Please go, um, sir. Yes, Tom from uh, Southern Wars. Uh, and you've probably picked up on a bit of the, the answer to all of this in already, but um, the I suppose it would be really interesting to... I'm seeing a lot of clusters, either that they're setting up now and they're not quite sort of gelling, or that they're coming to the end of their facilitation fund and still sort of not finding their way in terms of kind of priorities for the future. So uh, with that in mind, I'm co uh, the question is um, what the kind of long-term ingredients for success in terms of how, how you kind of get things to uh, bed in going forward, really. Yeah. Okay, who's going first? Yeah, well, I, I would say, I mean, I, I think I, I was, uh, as I said, we, I wouldn't have done this if it wasn't COVID, but we ended up doing a bit of a survey, okay, and, and um, it, it struck me before I did that survey that uh, you, you've got to be a bit careful about, about um, you know, obviously we talked about all these changes ha happening and these opportunities that are coming up in farming and not to make that assumption that every, you know, uh, everyone knows as much as you or you know as much as other people, right? So um, I think it's, it's really key that um, uh, people understand the context and uh, you know, some farmers are very proactive and understand that, and others might 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 have their heads in the sand and not want to think about it, and others other, others are just uh, very busy doing lots of other things as well. So, you know, I, th I think um, to make sure that your group, um, uh, you know, has has a real grasp of those potential uh, possibilities is is a, is a real key start for me. And I think don't overcomplicate. Um, we've, we've tried to focus specifically on hedges, pollinators, and ponds. Yes, we're doing a lot of other stuff as well, but if there's quite a narrow focus, it's, it's easier to, um, to keep people on board. And, and, and this aspect of, of buy-in, buy-in not just by the members of the group themselves, but the community. And I, and I think as, as members of the cluster, seeing, seeing it back through other people's eyes has reinforced our enthusiasm and uh, motivation going forward. So. Fine. So I think this is a really, really good question, and it's something I get asked a lot, is like, what, how do you uh, measure the success and what are the blockers to success? I think the thing I've heard a lot is having the right person. So I've met a lot of people that are in a cluster group and they say, we want to do more, we want to be like you, but we just don't really feel like there's much energy, we don't feel like there's a drive and uh, there's only one meeting a year or whatever. So I think having, having the right person is absolutely a crucial because you need someone that is able to work individually and as a group. They're very different things and to drive that change. But I think I was in the position where before my farmers were investing in the project, they were able to see the project without investing first. Does that make sense? So once they understood and could see the vision, then they wanted to invest. I also think investment is very important. For example, when I get pond restoration and I, do, I get grant funding that pays for the whole thing, I tend to find they're not as interested, whereas when they've match funded it or put 50% in, they're usually more interested in. So I think investment in the project, putting money where your mouth is into something means you're generally more motivated to see the outcome. But I think the future, looking at where Elm is going to go, looking at net gain, having a pinnacle person that knows that land better than a land agent, better than someone, no offense, but in the environment bank, that really understands that farming business is absolutely crucial. And I think once more cluster groups start to see that vision, I think it's just gonna go. And that's, that's what our group's done. Fantastic, great, thank you. Uh, we have another question here. And then I've got one final question, I think, going down there before I'll ask our panel for the final few words. But uh, over to you, sir. 
Thank you. Um, we, we've got a group of three or four farmers in Devon and we wanted to formulate a cluster and we decided to put it on hold because I think Natural England and the RPA weren't funding clusters at the present time. Are they, do you know, does anybody know on the panel if that is going to start again or whether we should be encouraged to continue anyway on the basis that it might one day? I'd be interested in your views, please. Who wants to take that one? Well, you can first. Well, uh, I, d I don't know any more than yeah. you do. I think it's a great shame there is no clarity on this. I think there's an opportunity both to get new groups like yourself, your one up and running uh, with the enthusiasm and, and to roll over existing uh, clusters. But um, no, I've not heard anything. I, th I, think, there I think there is. There is. But there is. And I, I think, um, you know, um, I think you've got to take, you know, facilitation funds are there, so you've, in my book, to facilitate new groups. Uh, and, and that's their sort of role. So uh, I think if you feel you fit into that, then it's definitely worth pursuing for sure, yeah. Yes, and I'm involved in helping to design the new environmental land management scheme. And, and obviously, this is a very important part of that from our view. Uh, and the best we can get out of DEFRA at the moment is it's being looked at. <laughs> Yeah, okay, very good. I hope that answers your question there. We've got another one down here, sir, for you. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, yeah, just a big thank you to all of you for doing what you're doing as clusters and all the cluster group people who are in here at the moment. You're doing a fantastic job and it needs to be done. And I've been lucky enough to speak with Upper Winter Cluster and uh, what I find going around when I do talk to people is some of the best ecologists are the farmers who are there on the ground. They know where the things are, they understand what you've got to save in the first place. You, you've already got your, you don't have to look for some reason. There's always going to be a turtle dove. There's always going to be a brown hair streak. There's always going to be fish in the river. Those things that you want to save. So there's there's a lot going on there. And Lizzie was quite right. DEFRA don't understand us. RPA don't understand us. Um, I think Natural England kind of do. Um, and they're frustrated that they can't push elms round to where it needs to be. So, uh, but my, my question has already been so I was going to ask about additional funding, which hopefully will be pushed into realms going forward. You wouldn't know any more about that. No, no, absolutely not. But that does give us at least time for one more question. I think there is one right there, conveniently. Um, so if you could just pass the microphone there, Paul. Over to you, sir. Hi. Thank you for your enthusiasm, panel. Um, I agree with Lizzie that the question seems to be that we need a pinnacle person or an organizer or coordinator. So how would you suggest we try and recruit somebody who would fit that role? Because that strikes me they're quite thin on the ground. Well then, Lizzie, how did you get recruited? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I saw a job advert. <laughs> um, I think I, I do actually get asked this quite often. And I think um, someone, someone asked me, do they have to be from a farming background? And, and I always say, I don't think so. But I, I am wary when it's very ecology based. You know, when I first started, the priorities were set to my farmers. And that's very dangerous. And that is very common with facilitation funding. Because let's not forget, DEFRA don't really like paying farmers. So, for example, we're having issues at the moment because we're trying to do a landscape recovery test and trial. And actually, they would feel much more comfortable if they paid the RSPV or if they paid National Trust. So, um, yeah, it, it's hard. And that's why the facilitation funding is quite a good step up. Um, I'd look in your local pool. I do know quite a few uh, sort of cluster groups where they're, for example, farmers' daughters or farmers' sons have got involved that have got good knowledge in the area. I would also, you know, branch out to your local sort of um, ecology groups, Norfolk Wildlife Trust, um, and see if you can get the right person. And have a panel. I mean, when I was interviewed, I've got Will at the back there. When I was interviewed, you gave me a good grilling. You know, make sure that you ask lots of good questions and get the right person. Tom? Yeah, and I think, um, I, think you, I, I, was, uh, I was sitting in one, a webinar with you on the other day, and uh, I think there was a, a little bit of a conversation around, uh, you know, obviously, if, if, if this blossoming of cluster groups happens, there is going to be a bit of a scramble to find the right people and and you know the potential of a, a buddy system or a mentoring opportunity um, for for newer 
facilitators would be would be a fantastic opportunity. And I think the other thing to say is, you know, um, you know, there are, there's some great advice out there from an ecology point of view, and from and 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 sometimes you could go with that person if 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 you know that's going to work. Uh, but of course, another reason for having a facilitator is is to spend their time finding that expertise that, that they don't necessarily have, so that they're skilled to to go look and go search for stuff like that. One thing I, uh, hasn't been mentioned, but I think must be mentioned because Lizzie's such a good example of it is social media. And you know, I I, I guarantee you, every single person in our West Cam's Hundreds group would, would 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 pay good money to make sure they never ever have to deal with social media, right? So um, you know, to ha but but you know, social media and having that that voice is absolutely fantastic, and the community buy-in you get from that. Um, and and I think that's a that's certainly a, a something I would ask in an interview if I was uh, interviewing for someone. So there's some very sound advice there, Tom. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts, panel? Any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with before I do a very short summary and wish everybody good, good afternoon? Lizzie. Yeah, so just my sort of follow-up points. What I believe is the three elements proven to succeed, and for those that are starting groups or can take this back, it's providing opportunity, so making, making opportunities and easy for farmers. It's encouraging empowerment and it's business security. They are the three things I believe are crucial to the success of your collaboration. Excellent, and Edward, William, sorry. Um, this is a message, Alistair, perhaps more for government when you're um, looking at the future of these schemes because I, I think these are very good value in these times of, of, of scarce resources, you're getting an immense bang for your buck. Lizzie mentioned the, uh, the match funding and how that actually improves motivation. I think, I think the government are getting very good value from encouraging these schemes and, uh, and the buy-in from, the, from their members. Anything else, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think that sort of one-to-one -one approach Lizzie talked, talked about and just appreciating that your group um, is made up of, uh, you know, human beings that are all a bit different and they all need a, maybe a slightly different approach, um, you know, but, but that, that effort to, to, to speak to people individually and as a group is a, is a great way, great, great start. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Well, a great deal of experience and wisdom we've learned there. And I think, you know, if we as society are serious about nature recovery, then this is one of the ways that we're going to have to do it. Uh, we simply can't do it by, by working on our own. Um, collaboration, and I, I think from, from the perspective of GWCT, farmers becoming not just interested in nature and wildlife and the things that are on their farm, but passionate about it, and it becoming as important part of their lives as their business and producing good crops. And I'm afraid to say that in the environmental land management scheme, what the government call landscape scale recovery is big visions of rewilding and afforestation station and grand flood prevention schemes, uh, mostly of which exclude farmers who are going to have to carry on producing food alongside the environmental goods that they deliver. So we really need to look at those schemes very carefully to make sure that farmers are absolutely at the heart of it. Uh, and the very final point I'm going to make is to actually focus on a piece of data that Lizzie put there, which I find quite scary, and that is that the only people that knew the levels of phosphate and nitrate in that catchment were actually the farmers, despite the fact that the modelers will point to the fact that most of that pollution in the catchment is coming from farming. Actually, it's not. And the farmers, farmers are constantly reminded of the amount of money that has to be spent to make water potable so that we can drink it due to diffuse pollution. But we never hear the other side of the story that the water companies are discharging from their treatment plants, as we call them. So uh, extremely useful, I think, we will find in these uh, pharma clusters, not just data on water being gathered, but on all the other aspects as well. So um, thank you very much for attending this session this afternoon. I hope you've in, enjoyed the show, and I hope you'll show your appreciation to our fantastic panel. Thank you. Thank you.